Oh, hold on. Let me, uh... Hi, there, James. Me. Yeah, don't worry. There you go. I can see you well. Hello. How are you doing, James? How's everything going Fine. there? Fine. Can you hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Yeah. I'm just trying to find the best way to... I'm in my daughter's room because I uh, don't have the best spot here. I'm... Don't worry, I'll let you There we go. There you go. So how have you been? Yeah. How's your recovery from, from COVID last time we spoke? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine now, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I had it pretty bad. I had a fever for like seven or eight days and then I had a cough that lingered for a long time after that, but I'm pretty much fine now. I, every now and then I still get a little tickle in my throat, even now, like, you know, over a month later, but, um, yeah, it was not fun. <laughs> I can imagine. It's pretty weird. Some people get it really lightly. Some people get it really badly. It's like yeah. a gamble, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And your family is your family okay, James? Yep, everybody's good, and uh, um, yeah, we it, it kind of rips through all of us all at the same time. So, um, oh. but, but we're all we're all good now. So, very well. I'm glad to hear it. So, anyway, thanks for joining me. Thanks for accepting my invitation. It's truly an honor and a privilege. It's mind blowing yeah. to be talking to you, man. So, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. Very well. So, the topic at hand. I don't think there's a better mind for this particular topic than you, about training volume for hypertrophy, because, well, yeah. you have you have the now available for everyone a training Bible, the volume yeah. training Bible. So that's a, an unbelievable resource. I, I All the time I'm, I'm telling my friends and so on, my students, to check that out. So yeah, yeah. in regards to volume, I think we can start by some mm, basic concepts, because I know training volume has been defined... Uh, across time differently, you know, uh, volume yeah. low, hard sets with the uh, with the uh, Greg Knuckles definition, and then we have some some research in regards to that repetitions per session. So, James, what is training volume? I, I'm sorry if uh, it's a basic question, but I think it's a good starting point. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I define it. I, I, I tend to kind of side with Greg on this. Um, I kind of look at it as the number of hard sets per session. Um, because there's just too many limitations with the other volume metrics. For example, volume load doesn't really work when you're comparing, like, let's say, high reps to low reps and things like that, because, you know, I can do three sets of 20 reps to failure and get way higher volume load than, you know, say, three sets of eight reps to failure, but the hypertrophy will probably be similar. So, um, so I'm not, you know, volume load has a lot of limitations. Um, I would say volume just in pure repetitions has a lot of limitations because now you've totally taken the load out of the equation. Um, you know, I just think uh, the number of, I would say, hard sets, you know, uh, is probably your best – uh, at least, at least when I'm talking about volume, that's kind of what I'm referring to. Um, right. You know, I think it's you know, and when I say hard sets, I'm talking about you know sets with a decent number of reps. So I'm not talking about you know three sets of three or something like that. You know, you know, I'm talking about sets of probably at least five to six reps or so um, or higher. And uh, um, but I would say you know roughly like you know say three sets of eight three sets of, uh, uh, you know, three hard sets of eight is going to be roughly equivalent to three sets, three hard sets of 20 um, from a hypertrophy standpoint. So. So the main reason is that hard sets actually takes into account the, the level of effort, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very well. So how many, set, we can start building off from there. How many sets, uh, can we shoot for because it's really a an evolving topic i was in your it yes. was the i have the name of the it was a recent conference it was online about hypertrophy it was eric helms and so on and you spoke yeah. about eric helms being batman if you remember that one oh, yeah how, yeah that one yep 
that very same. Yeah, one. I remember doing that one. Yeah, which I, I I later talked to Eric about him being Batman, and he he neither agree nor disagree. So the jury is still out. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> how has your your understanding of how much training volume do we need changed over the past few years? Because this was this there was this volume words uh, a while back that, you know, Sean thought yourself and all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nah, it was quite, <laughs> quite a situation. How can you understand, how do you understand volume nowadays in regards to how many hard sets does one need? Yeah, yeah, I have evolved a lot over, over time. And it's just because, you know, as we've gotten new research, you know, I've kind of, you know, modified my thinking based on new research and things like that, you know, and, And I mean, where I'm at now is, you know, if, if someone comes to me and asks me, well, how many sets should I do? Um, I, what I like to, what I like to use volume now is just as a form of progressive overload. So what I favor now is that there's no, there's no one set answer for how much volume you should do. I, I think it's very highly individual and, Um, and I think it's something that people need to kind of arrive at on their own. Um, and, and the way that I kind of like people to try to go about that is to start off very low volume and, you know, progress as far as you can on low volume. And when you hit plateaus, then you bump your volume up, you know, you increase your number of sets, um, by a small amount. Um, and that should theoretically, um, stimulate some more progress and so you keep doing this like you, you you bump your volume up you get some more progress you hit another plateau you bump your volume up again and eventually you're going to hit a point where you'll you'll plateau you'll increase your volume you still won't progress anymore and then you might okay well, let's try increasing volume a little bit more see if that does anything and then you're still stuck then you're probably maxed out in terms of your upper limit for volume for you specifically. Um, and, and so I tend to favor once you reach that point, um, maybe cycling your volume back down, you know, deloading and maybe starting the whole process over again. Now I would say, I think if most people, I think if most people kind of went through this process, I think on average, most people are probably going to fall in that typical, you know, 10 to 20 weekly set range, probably. I'd say most people. Some people will be higher than that. Some people will be lower. Um, but, you know, if assuming you're taking longer rests between sets, you know, at least two to three minutes, you know, things kind of change if you're doing short rests. But if you're taking longer rests between sets, I, I think most people are probably eventually going to fall within that range, you know, uh, probably the – The, 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 you know, like I said, probably 10 to 20 weekly sets, which is kind of where I used to be at, you know, that's used to be, you know, you know, three, four years ago, that's kind of the rec blanket recommendation we would make to most people. But now I've, that recommendation now to me is modified, uh, to be more individualized. So, um, um, so like I said, uh, use volume as a progressive overload tool, um, Once you've continued to try to increase your volume to try to overcome plateaus, once you hit plateaus and, and, and further increases in volume aren't helping, yeah, then you deload and you back that down and maybe you start the whole cycle again. Maybe change your exercises, you know, things like that, maybe for some variation, things like that. But, um, but yeah, and so that's kind of where I'm at now. You know, I, I don't view volume as this, like, this set number that you have to be in. Um, And, uh, you know, um, and it's kind of funny because now I just, I kind of look at back all these volume wars and everything. And I just kind of think how ridiculous it all is now, you know, it was just all kind of dumb, uh, you know? Um, and so, um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at now. I, I would say in terms of my thinking on volume, you know, uh, so. That's really interesting because how, how can we define progress? Are we talking about progressive overload? And, and, and so, in regards to progressive overload, sorry to interrupt. It, yeah. it, it's funny that we can use uh, volume load as a means of progression. And it's yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. full circle, right? Oh, yeah. And, and for me, 
I just uh, I like to keep it simple in terms of progress. Just just your basic double progression, meaning, right. you know, you have a certain rep range that you like to train in. Once you exceed that rep range with whatever load you're using, you bump the load up, you know, and then it puts you back in whatever that rep range. So let's say your rep range is, you know, say eight to 12 reps or whatever. Once you can start doing 13, 14, 15 reps with a certain load, you know, you bump the weight up a little bit. And so, and then you do that again until you, again, start to exceed your rep range or whatever. So it's just... You know, very simple double progression model, um, I, I think, is, you know, that's how I'll define progression. Um, and and if you're doing multiple sets, you know, let's say you're doing, you know, three sets or whatever. Um, I'll define, at least for me personally, um, and people I've coached in the past, I don't really uh, coach much anymore, but um, people I've coached in the past, um I'll, I'll, I'll say any increase in any one of those sets would be defined as progress. So, for example, let's say you're doing three sets of an exercise, and your first two sets, you literally did the same rep, same weight as last time. But on your third set, you get one more rep than you did last time at, the, at that weight. That, to me, that's progress, right? right. You, you know, and, and so, whoops. Um, so yeah, that that's you know I try to keep you know progress you know the idea of progress simple um, and uh, you know I don't think there yeah, I don't think you really need to complicate it with calculating the volume load and stuff like that because again I want to say there's a lot of limitations to using volume load um, uh, you know even small deviations from a rep range can kind of invalidate the use of volume load as a as a metric so. Um, that's why I don't really like using it as, as a metric of progress. Like I said, just basic double progression set, you know, uh, tracking what you can do on certain sets and, and, you, you know, whatever loads you can do for certain sets and rep ranges. And I, I think that's, I think that's going to work pretty well for most people. So. So how can we make the decision that it's necessary to increase volume because volume load per se, it might not be the best of tools. But it can give yeah. us a hint, right? How oh, do you yeah, yeah, yeah. decide when it's appropriate to increase volume sets? So, again, there's no set answer. What I like to do, and again, this is just kind of a, I, I would say, a pragmatic recommendation. It's not based on any data or anything like that. Um, I like to use, uh, you know, if you are stuck for at least two training sessions where you have, like, no progress at all, assuming... Now that's assuming a couple things, assuming you haven't been sick and there's nothing interfering with your recovery or anything like that. Assuming, you know, you're eating good, all that other stuff. And you're just, you've been stuck for at least two training sessions. I would say, okay, maybe that's a good point to try to bump your volume up. Right. Um, you know, and, uh, um, um, and like I said, you know, I, just a very small increase in volume, adding like one set to an exercise, you know, and, and see how it goes, you know, and, uh, um, and I like to keep it exercise specific. So, you know, uh, you know, if you're doing, you know, let's say three exercises for a muscle group, um, two of the two exercises have been progressing, but one hasn't then you just bump the volume up on the, the exercise that has not been progressing, you know, um, keep the volume the same on the other exercises. So, uh, so I, so I think, you know, that's what I, at least I like to do is keep it exercise specific. So. Very well. I and mean, if we decide to increase this one, actually one of the key takeaways from your volume Bible to do it a uh, little by little, I think it's 20%, yeah. right? It might be like, wow, yeah, two sets. Yeah, that's yeah, that's and that was based on a, a a pretty good study that was done in the past couple of years, where they kind of tested the idea of of a small bump in volume and compared it to just putting everyone on the same volume. And the small progression uh, did way better. And and so yeah, so you know probably you know whatever the smallest increase in volume that you can do, um, which is obviously just one set. <laughs> I mean, you can't really do. You know, unless you're doing like, I mean, I guess you could, you know, do rest pause or something like that, I guess. But, um, but yeah, just adding one set and, and just doing it that way. Again, I, I, I think we, you know, we tend to overcomplicate training, I think sometimes, you know, and, 
you know, and I, I think we tend to overanalyze and overcomplicate it sometimes. And, and, uh, like I said, just kind of keep it simple and, and, um, you know, and I think that's going to work for most people. So I love that you say that because I'm guilty of that, but it's part of the fun of it, right? To oh yeah, 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 yeah. It is kind of fun to kind of get really ner get really nerdy about your training and stuff, you know. And <laughs> so, so to dive actually right into nerdy stuff, can we talk a little bit about the relationship between training volume and uh, muscle protein synthesis, anabolic signaling, and maybe if we have the time, satellite cells? What is the impact of doing more sets on those three? Yeah, and so it's actually very similar. I mean, we we do know there's some protein synthesis studies and some molecular signaling studies that do show an increase in muscle protein synthesis with an increase in volume, w with more sets in a session. But even there's some data there that suggests it does plateau off. Um, I know there was a rodent study that was done. Of course, it's rodents. Um, but at least did bring up the idea that, yeah, there is, you know, there's a point where doing more sets isn't going to help you, right? You know, and like I said, you can ask me, well, how do you know where that is? And I, and I said, well, there's no magical way to know. It's like, we just have to use our progression and kind of see, you know, uh, um, but we do know that, um, you know, eventually there's a point where you're adding more sets is, isn't going to help you any further. Right. Um, and, and if anything, you could get theoretically at least get to a point where doing even more sets just makes things worse for you. You know, um, It's kind of that, um, uh, or, uh, you know, inverted U hypothesis of training or whatever, where, uh, you know, um, you increase volume up to a point, but, but regardless there, there it, it basically it's, it's diminishing returns, right? I mean, each new set you add just, you know, if you add another set, yes, yeah, it might give you a little bit more stimulation, but not as much as the set before and, you know, and so on. And, and you get to a point where, You, you add another set and it barely improves anything if, if anything at all. So, so it is a point of, you know, there are diminishing returns with continuing to add sets, you know? So, um, but again, that, 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 that point where that point is, is going to be highly individual. And how can we know how, how far to push it? Because we have this, these guidelines, uh, 10 to 20, 12 to 20, your own in-house meta-analysis, six to eight per, per session. How yeah. far can we go? Because then we then we dive into the the volume worth. If you recall that, I'm sure you recall. I, I, I know, and, and again, I'm gonna right, right. Uh, I'm gonna you know again, I'm gonna say, uh, assuming you're taking long rest between sets, because short rest kind of complicates things. Um, assuming you're taking long rest between sets, again, I just think if you follow that volume progression model. Uh, I, I can't say there's some limit. You know, I can say on average. You know, most people will probably top out, like I said, in the 10 to, 10 to 20 weekly set range, but some people won't. And like I said, I mean, that one study I talked about that did the 20% increase in volume, there were some people that they were doing 30 weekly sets and then they bumped their volume up to what, 36 weekly sets and they, and they got more progress, right? So, um, you know, and so they were way out of that theoretical range. Um, but Um, but you, you, you can't know that ahead of time until you experiment, I, I would say, with that kind of volume progression model. And, and like I said, you just keep trying to add sets until you say, hey, I've added some volume and I'm not, I'm not getting any better, right? And, and so I've obviously probably maxed out my whatever, whatever my upper limit for volume is for me personally, it looks like I've probably maxed it out. And like I said, it could be 10 weekly sets, could be 20. Some, some people, it could be 30. You know, I, I'd say that that's not going to be true for most people, but some people, it could be that high, you know, and, and you really don't know ahead of time until you try it. Right. So until your arm, your arm falls off, maybe you're training yeah. like four hours. Maybe, maybe that's the upper limit, right? Maybe I'm pushing yeah. it too far. Yeah. Very well. I wanted to ask you also and that one of the key caveats from those really high volume studies, the Radieli and then the one you did with Brad, is that the, you both used short rest intervals, right? And it's yeah. kind of a compensation that you need to do way more sets than if we did uh, longer rest intervals, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And, and that was, you know, and that was something that, that did not really dawn on me at the time when Brad and I did our study, um, you know, because there just wasn't enough research at the time, you know. I mean, when Brad and I did the study, um, you know, we had basically replicated a study by another research group um, out of Brazil. And, you know, at the time I was thinking, hey, you know, maybe this upper limit to volume is higher than we thought, right? Um, but then as more research came out, I just started to see a pattern, right? Because some studies were showing a plateau at much lower volumes and other studies were not. And it became very apparent to me that the studies that were not showing a plateau at higher volume, like Brad's study and the, and the study out of Brazil, actually it was two studies. Another study came out of Brazil by a different group. Um, all those studies that showed these, you know, really high volumes all use pretty short rest intervals, you know, one minute, you know, 90 seconds. And, um, and, um, and so it became pretty apparent to me that, and especially then another study came out just on rest intervals alone that actually, I think Brad was an author on that showed that, because we know that short rest intervals tend to impair hypertrophy. And then Brad, I think, was involved in a study. Actually, I think I just made an Instagram post about it. I did, uh, like, just a few days ago, um, where, um, you know, they compared long rest to short rest, but then uh, they had a short rest condition that increased the number of sets. Right. And suddenly they got the same hypertrophy as the long rest condition. And so, so what that indicates to me is that if you're using short rests, then yeah, your volume, your volume levels that, that you, you, that you got to do before you reach a plateau are going to be much higher, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you're going to get more hypertrophy out of it. It's just like, the short rests are basically impairing hypertrophy. So now you got to do a bunch more sets to make up for it. And so that's why, that's why Brad's study showed these, you know, 40 weekly sets and, and a few other studies showed that they were all using short rests and that's why they showed that. And what's interesting is if you look at the long rest studies, you know, they show plateaus, you know, typically on average, at least at less than 20 weekly sets. And so, so I think that's just the major differentiator between these different types of studies. And so, um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, again, you know, when that paper, when Beth, Brad and I did that paper at the time, it, it didn't, it wasn't apparent to me at the time because there just wasn't enough data. And, and over time I just kind of saw this pattern and that, you know, that's pretty much my working, you know, I think there's enough data to establish that. So I think it's a pretty good hypothesis at least on why you see these different, you know, why you see some studies showing, you know, there's, you know, 40 plus sets and it seems like people just keep getting more hypertrophy and other studies don't. And, and I think that's probably a, uh, uh, a pretty good explanation, you know, as to why that happens, you know, so. Um, it was, it was quite great. That's why I say, it was like, oh, I was just going to say, that's why I say, you know, the, the caveat, that's why I say, I said a lot of times, assuming you're taking long rests, right. You know, sure. you know, two to three minute rests. So, yeah. Because the poor subjects, if I recall correctly, they were doing squats to failure, right? Like resting like 90 seconds. I don't know. Yeah, they survived. <laughs> yeah I know. That's the, that's the thing. So I just think, you know, when you're doing that, I think that the quality of each set suffers. And so you got to do more sets to make up for the lack of quality, you know? Um, so. So volume needs across the training career. Do you think it's um it's safe to say that maybe beginners need less volume intermediates maybe fall in the 10 to 20 category and then may maybe advanced people because then you have uh, people like Je jeff alvarez that train with lesser volume do you think that has an impact in your re in your volume needs the training career I, i think so i mean i do think you know the more advanced you are chances are you probably will need a little bit more volume right. uh, but even an advanced person is going to eventually reach a point where you know, more volume is not going to help, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think beginners, like I said, especially if you're a beginner, I, I, I would say, you know, train with as low a volume for as long as you can, um, you know, try to eke, eke out as much from low volume as you can. Um, you know, uh, and, and, um, And then, you know, you can start to play with, you know, increases in volume and stuff. But, uh, and, I, and I say that for a lot of reasons. I just say, you know, um, don't get yourself to adapt to a higher volume to the point where you're going to need higher volume too early, you know. Um, 
And, and also just from a, I'd say, um, you know, joint integrity and things like that standpoint, um, you know, you're just going to be better off trying to keep your volume much lower for as long as you can before you have to up it, you know? So, um, I mean, I know with me, even me personally, I mean, I started off my training career, pretty low volume trainer. And I still would say that probably 50 to 75% of the gains that I've made in my 20 years came with off that low volume training in the first, you know, two years of my training or whatever, you know? So, um, you know, and then it just, it gets diminishing returns. It gets harder and harder each year to, 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 to get more gains out, you know? And, and so, so like I said, you know, try to ride that low volume as low as, as low as you can, or I say as long as you can until you start trying to up it, you know? So. No, man, I wish I would heard that uh, a couple of years back because I used, I used to be the exact opposite. And that's something you see pretty much every day here in, in, in the gyms. Yeah. Uh, beginners tend yeah. to do a shit ton of sense. <laughs> and then, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Advanced, yeah. advanced people tend to be a little wiser and got a little yeah. more time, which is funny that it's the other way around, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, James, one thing that I'm dying to ask you is about this. I think he has uh, changed or elaborated a little bit more about this topic. I'm talking about Mike Isrotel and the volume progression uh, model that maybe you go mm -hmm. from your minimum effective to your maximum recoverable because that's been criticized because not always more volume equals more, more hypertrophy. Maybe more volume equals more, um, more capacity to do the total work. What is your current mm -hmm. stance on, on that volume progression model? And how does it differentiate it from the one that Eric Helms proposed? That it's more like you said at the beginning, you you choose a given uh, repetition range, and when you stop progressing, that's when you consider another step. If your recovery is okay, if your nutrition, blah blah blah. How do you conceptualize both these these proposals? I, I mean, I just think that the main difference, I think, between let's say Mike's method and you know Eric's or even my method. Uh, it, um, there seems to be less, uh, I, I would say, um, you know, Eric's and my method and stuff like that tends to be more auto regulatory in nature. Like, sure. you know, um, Mike's method, you know, the, the, the increases in volume are more programmed in, like it just, uh, it, it happens automatically, which one is better, you know, I think over the long run, I think if you did a study over the long run, you're, you're, there's probably not going to be a difference. I mean, I, I like me personally, I like the auto regulatory approach just because I think it's easier to individualize it. And, you know, um, in, in that sense, um, you know, but, you know, I, I, I know some people have used Mike's approach and really like it, you know, and, uh, you know, they are, they're both volume cycling approaches, you know. I don't think there's huge, there's not major differences between them. It's just that one tends, one is, like I said, one is auto regulatory, only increases volume when you need to increase it. The other one, the, the increases in volume are literally programmed in and, and also the deloads are programmed in like, uh, right. you know, um, they're not, it, it's not reactive. So, um, uh, so I would say that's the major difference. Um, Which one is better? Like I said, me personally, I think it's better to auto regulate. But you know, like I said, I um, I, I know some people who have great, have had great success with Mike's stuff, and you know, I, I again, I think it's you know, with with training, people tend to, I, I think people tend to overanalyze it and stuff like that too much, and you know, um, you know, I, I think. I, I think there's a lot, there's a lot more room for personal preference and training than I think people realize, you know, right, right. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big fan of, of flexibility and, and, you know, designing your training program around your preferences. Um, you know, as long as you're just hitting like basic principles, you know, as long as you're working within certain basic principles, you know, you're going to be fine, you know? So, yeah. I think that's the, the funny thing about hypertrophy training. We can do a lot of stuff that seems different from, from far away. But if you look at the, the, the things that all these programs, all these ideologies, quote unquote, have yeah. in common, they do sufficient volume. They do, they do sufficient uh, proximity to failure. 
they might or might rest between two minutes, less than that, more than that, but all the key yeah. components are there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, I just, you know, like I said, uh, people love to overanalyze this stuff and, and, and really you, you can't overanalyze it because number one, each person is different. I, I mean, there's just, there's so many, you know, uncontrolled variables when it comes to training. It's like, you know, like I said, it's, you know, there's, yeah, there's some science to it, but there's a lot of art to it too, you know, and there always will be, you know, so. Yeah, I, I also love that you say that because most people tend to think about the evidence-based practice as this super linear thing that you need to do. Oh, you did nine sets per session? Oh, you, you screwed up, man. Oh, you're doing yeah, 21 yeah, yeah, yeah. sets, but it's really nothing like that, right? There's a lot of art in this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. One of the things I also wanted to discuss with you, James, is uh, maybe falling in between all these propositions about volume cycling and whatnot. Uh, and it's uh, specialization cycles that I know you did one a while back. I was yeah, witness yeah, yeah. to that one with Jacob Skepis from Australia. Uh, I think it was for biceps, right? Like his arms blew off and I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus, yeah. I might try that. You think it's a better way to understand this maybe going from the minimum to the maximum, not for every muscle group, but maybe for some muscle group that it's a little bit behind? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great way... I mean, I know Brian Cron is a coach that has done this with some of his, his clients and stuff, and it's worked out great for him. Um, yeah, if you got some lagging body part or whatever, I, I mean, this is the thing. Here's what people need to realize. It, it takes very little training to maintain your muscle, even if you're an advanced trainee. And so you can take advantage of that. I mean, if you've got good muscle size and then you've got one or two muscle groups that are really lagging, you know what? Just put put all your muscle groups on maintenance for a long time and just focus on those one or two muscle groups you want to bring out. You're not going to, you're not going to lose muscle in, in the other muscle groups just because you bet you've you know backed off on the volume. As long as you're doing some volume with them and some training with them, they're going to maintain their muscle, you know? Um, um, and so I think people need to realize that. And, and I think, you know, definitely, especially more advanced trainees, they can really take advantage of that concept And like I said, Jacob took, totally took advantage of that concept and his arms blew up, you know, did a total yeah. arm specialization cycle. He put everything else on just maintenance mode and, and, uh, yeah, his arms just blew up, you know? So, um, how could we know what is the, the maintenance volume? Do you think it's half the recommendations? Let's say five sets, something like that's a good story. Yeah. yeah it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I mean, I know there's some data that, that, Uh, even cutting your volume to as little as maybe one third of what you were doing before will maintain your muscle mass. So if you were doing, you know, 15 weekly sets before you could literally cut it down to five to six weekly sets and you would probably, and you would maintain your muscle. So, um, you know, cutting it down to like a third or so of what you were doing before and you'll, it'll be, you'll maintain, you'll maintain on that, you know? So, right. Right, and I think one of the also key aspects about training volume is, well, what are your thoughts on direct versus indirect volume? Let's say squats, do we count it just for the quads? Do we also count it for the glutes? Um, do we have any recommendations for this? Yeah, that's, that's a tough call because, again, I think this, that's one of those things where people tend to overanalyze it. We don't know, you know, and I mean, I know with... Uh, in the meta-analyses and stuff that I've done with Brad and stuff, um, we basically counted even indirect work as, as a set for that muscle group. As long as it, you know, I mean, unless it's really indirect, you know, but, you know, so for example, you know, I, I'll count a bench press as counting towards your triceps. I'll count a, a row as counting towards your biceps, things like that. Um, you know, Um, I know some people will count it as a half set, you know, I, again, I think if you just, just use those progression models again, you know, and, and I think it'll take care of itself. You know, I do think, you know, it definitely, if you're training for hypertrophy and you're a bodybuilder or physique athlete, you do need some direct work, you know, um, but you don't need to add a huge amount of direct work on top of the indirect work you're doing. But again, just use the progression models, you know, um, uh, you know, whatever direct work you're doing, like I said, 
you know, you hit a plateau on those exercises, try adding some volume to those exercises. You know, either you're going to bust through the plateau or you won't and maybe try adding a little bit more volume. And if it still doesn't work, then, you know, you've probably maxed out on that volume. So, um, so again, I think if you follow kind of an auto regulatory volume progression approach, I think it'll take care of itself anyway, you know, so. Man, I love that we can go into the nitty gritty details of every study, but at the end of the day, uh, your very own words are keep it simple. No need to overcomplicate, yeah. but doesn't need to be overcomplicated, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, James, another thing I wanted to ask you is about um, what are the factors that maybe differentiate the volume needs between individuals? Is it a genetic component? Is there sex difference? Do you think there's a, which it, it, it's also a, a recent discussion. Do you think the, um, the caloric intake could be a mediator of the volume needs? Let's say someone is in a deficit. They need a little bit more to increase muscle protein synthesis or in your experience, in your, your understanding of the literature, what are the factors, the key factors that may, may increase the volume needs or decrease them? Um, well, obviously training experience is one, but I, I would say genetics is going to be the biggest one, like, right. like genetics is going to be huge. Um, and there's some data to actually show that, um, you know, uh, um, I know there was a within subject design where they had people train, uh, with one leg and then train with another leg. And some people benefited from an increase in volume. Other people didn't, you know, so it definitely, I, I think genetics is probably going to be the biggest factor. Um, Uh, training experience. I, I, I don't think there's enough data on gender um, to know if there's going to be a difference there. Um, in terms of caloric needs or, you know, how many calories you're taking in, I'm not a fan of decreasing your volume for contest prep or whatever. I think you should at least try to maintain your volume. Um, and in fact, I think there may even been, I know there was a review paper on that recently, I think, and uh, their conclusions was kind of the same, that it's probably better to at least maintain your volume uh, during periods of it being in a deficit and not decreasing your volume. Um, do you need to do more volume when in a deficit? I, I don't know the answer to that question, um, but definitely I would not decrease my volume in a deficit. Um, and... Uh, Um, so yeah, but I, it, it, it still comes down to genetics. I mean, uh, genetics just plays a huge, huge role in how you respond to volume and there's no way to know ahead of time, you know, whether you're going to be a high volume or low volume responder, you know, you just have to try and see, you know, I know some people will think, Oh, someone who's naturally muscular will respond better to more volume. And I don't know, th th um, I don't know of any data suggests that's true. Um, you know, um, uh, uh, I, I, I just think there's no way to know until you actually just start training and trying some of these, you know, trying to see where you can go with your volume progression and seeing where it ends up, you know, so. Very well. Until you begin to do the work, right? Yeah. Yep. Very well, James. So another thing I wanted to ask you, I know there's a lot of things. I'm sorry about that. But I gotta take advantage of the situation, right? It's about the efficacy of sets, but per exercise. Let's say we we decided to increase volume, but we have mm -hmm. let's talk about hamstrings. We have a Romanian deadlift, uh, and we have a seated leg curl. How can we decide to which increase volume based on what? I don't know if I'm explaining myself correctly. But I don't know if you understand the question. But in, if we decided to increase set volume. How can mm -hmm. I make the choice of which exercise is that volume for? I, I'm just, I'm, I'm a fan of whatever exercise is plateaued is the one you increase volume for. Right. You know, if you're still progressing, you know, like I said, if, if you're progressing on the seated leg curls, but you're not progressing on the Romanian deadlifts, then increase the volume on the Romanian deadlifts. Keep the volume the same on the seated leg curls. That, that's, I think I'd said earlier, that's why I think um, this whole auto -reg regulatory method of increasing volume should be very exercise specific. So just, just keep it to the exercises that have plateaued and increase volume on those exercises that have plateaued. Um, but you can still, you know, if you're progressing in an exercise, in a specific exercise, there's no reason to increase volume until you hit a plateau on that exercise, you know, so. And do you think there's an upper limit per exercise? Because if we increase, I'm, I'm plateauing squats. 
I'm increasing one set in squats, one set in squats. Well, maybe that's going to cause me a little bit more fatigue than increasing it in length extensions, right? Do you think there's an, um, a possible limit to that? Well, I, I do think there's a limit, but I think uh, – can I say where that is? No, I don't know where that is, but yeah, there's going to be some limit, but again, it's going to be highly individual where that limit occurs, you right. know? Um, uh, but yeah, you're, you're not going to be able to just keep adding more and more sets, you know, because at some point, like I said, you're going to add more sets and then you're going to notice, Oh, I, I didn't progress. Like I added some more volume and I didn't progress. Um, and okay, well, let me try adding one more set. Oh, I'm still not progressing. Okay. You know, obviously I'm at whatever upper limit from, for this particular exercise that I can, you know, reach, you know, so. Right. And what are your thoughts on John volume? Because uh, I think it's a study by Cody Hahn that they increase volume and up to a point of, I think it was 20 sets. They do increase hypertrophy, but by a really small margin. Do you think that can be categorized as junk volume? I, 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 uh, I think so. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about Cody's study is um, a lot of the sets were sub-maximal sets, so right. um, it was a little bit different um, in way it was structured versus if, if every set is a hard set. Um, but I do think, yeah, I, I do think you do get junk volume. I mean, when, like I said, if you keep adding sets and you're not progressing, obviously those sets that you've added aren't helping you, you know. Yes. The, the point at which adding more sets is not helping you progress anymore yeah, that's junk volume. It's just it's just causing fatigue, and it's not actually causing any more progress. So, so yeah, I do think junk volume is a real thing, you know. So, and do you think that junk volume is beyond the general guidelines, or is something that we need to find out by ourselves? I, I think you got to find it by yourself. I think again, I think I think most people, I think a good you know probably sixty to seventy percent of people are still probably going to fall in that. 10 to 20 weekly set range and you start getting above that is probably going to be junk volume. But I don't think you can know that it's junk volume until you try and you keep adding more sets and you're not getting anywhere. Right. And so, so I do think it's going to be still highly individual where that, where that junk volume starts to where that point is going to be, you know? So. Very well. Again, until your arm falls, falls off, then you know that maybe that was junk volume. Maybe it was a little bit too much and it's cut it out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so James to practically finish off um, could you give us some brief practical takeaways I know it's a whole um, it's a lot to ask for, to ask for because it's it's quite the, the, the big topic but can, can you give us in your experience and your current understanding on volume some brief takeaways um, yeah I think the brief takeaways are um, use volume as a progressive overload tool um, only add sets when you need to you know, when you're not progressing anymore, add sets or add a set, you know, keep the, keep the increases in volume low. Um, you know, theoretically that should stimulate some more progress. Um, and, and just keep doing that until, until you try to increase volume at least a couple times and it doesn't like you're still stuck. Right. And then at that point, at that point, okay, maybe it's time for a deload, right? Maybe it's time to back off cut your volume back down, maybe do some new exercises, you know, um, and then, and then start your, your cycle again. And, and, you know, that's kind of the theoretical model. I think it's a, it's a, it's a simple model. It's easy to follow. Um, and I, you know, and I think it's going to work well for most people, you know, um, and, and, and it's an easy way to auto regulate and individualize volume for yourself you know, without having some magical number that you feel like you got to shoot for, you know, so. Right. You, t you tend to be more reactive, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm more in, uh, like I said, uh, I, I, that's kind of where I'm at in, in my, uh, where I can, I, I, I believe more in terms of reactive, both, both in terms of your increases in volume being reactive to, you know, whatever your progression is, and also reactive deloads, you know, when you finally reach a point where you're just not progressing anymore, like, okay, you know, this is the time to deload and back off and, you know, and the interesting thing too, and, and I know Eric Helms will say this too, um, real life situations, you're going to have, you're going to have basically deloads 
in, you're going to end up with deloads in your training anyway because you're going to be forced to deload because you go on vacation or right. you know you've got a family and suddenly you you've reached you know for a two weeks you've got to back off how much your training volume because you've got a bunch of stuff going on or whatever real life tends to cause you to deload at times anyway you know so like i said i mean you also got to work it in your real life you know unless you're a professional and you're doing this for a living you know you're a professional bodybuilder or whatever um or you or you or you're you're a personal trainer you're in the gym all the time a lot of people are going to have deloads programs kind of programmed for them uh just because life is gonna life is just gonna cause that you know so life gets in the way of training and gains right sadly <laughs> yeah <laughs> Very well, James. So I don't want to take any more of your time. I really do appreciate you taking the time for this. Uh, I yeah. hope you're doing better, you and your family. Anytime yeah, you want to come to Mexico, you're more than welcome. I hope one day we can meet. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so I hope you have, you have a great rest of the day. And thanks again, James. Such a privilege. Yep. Such an honor. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you, James. See you later. Okay, bye.